I'm Karen Hording, Executive Director and CEO for the Society, and it's my pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, Karen Elizari. Karen is a former hacker turned cybersecurity expert. She is now an international speaker and author on matters of cybersecurity and privacy, and I believe there will be a little giveaway um, based on uh, being an author here tonight. Um, since 2000, Karen has worked with leading Israeli security firms, government organizations, and global corporations. Her research and writing about security have been featured by Scientific American, CNN, and more international media networks. Karen not only holds a CISSP security certification and master's in security studies from Tel Aviv University, but she is also a senior researcher with the Balotnik Interdisciplinary Cyber Research Center. In 2014, Karen became the first Israeli woman to be invited to speak at the annual TED conference. Let's welcome Karen. Good evening, ladies, and thank you so much for the warm welcome. I can't begin to tell you how exciting and special it is for me to speak to a room filled with women engineers. I guess you know it doesn't happen every day, right? <laughs> okay. So it's a special honor and a privilege for me. And what I would like to do in the time we have together tonight, I would like to invite you to join me on a journey, a journey to the hacker's world, which is where I come from. And I know it might seem dark or scary, but I promise you, if you let me take you on this journey, you will learn a few things and maybe even be inspired to think like hackers yourselves. I know it's a tall order. I know right now you're thinking about hackers and that's all the bad stuff out there in the world that you don't want to know about. But I'm here to tell you about this stuff and I would like to empower you to think like hackers because for me, it's always been the hacker's perspective, which I've taken with me for as long as I can remember. So are you ready to go on this journey with me? Yes? Okay. So this will be a journey both to the future of cybersecurity, but also to our role as women and as engineers and what we can do in this future and why this future needs us to save it. So we have to start thinking like hackers. And I'll give you a few good reasons to do so. I'll start in the past, though. Every good journey starts in a good point in history. And this point in history is from about 20 years ago. This is Mr. Nicolas Negroponte from the MIT Media Lab in the United States. 20 years ago, in 1995, Mr. Negroponte authored a book about the digital future. The book is called, very simply, Being Digital. And in this book, Mr. Negroponte prophesied that pretty soon, in the future of humanity, bits and bytes of information are going to be more meaningful and more impactful for our lives, our daily lives, than physical atoms and molecules. In other words, he prophesied that pretty soon, paper books are not going to be sold as much as digital books, and our lives are going to move more and more into the digital realm. 20 years ago, it seemed like science fiction, but today it's absolutely a reality for many of us, and our lives are indeed digital. Every aspect of our lives, our social life, our professional life, sometimes even our romantic life, especially if you happen to be a client of this website. <laughs> now, I know for a fact that nobody in this room is a client of this website. <laughs> I know this for two reasons. One, I checked all of your names against the leaked <laughs> customer database. But the second reason is that when this website was hacked last year, out of the 20 million, or let's say a little bit less, but about 20 million customers that were supposed to be listed, about 99.9% were men. Not surprising there. And the remainder profiles of women, uh, many of them were fake profiles, uh, they were chatbots, or they were profiles created by the proprietors of this website to attract more people to, to join the website. The reason I'm telling you, though, about Ashley Medicine, which is this uh, website's brand, I'm sure you've never heard about it, and you've never used it, and nobody here doesn't even know anyone that's ever used it. 
but I looked into it. When I heard about this hack, the massive hack that took down Ashley Madison and released all of the customer information online, I was curious, why? Why would somebody do this? Were these hackers working for the Pope? Are they protecting the sanctity of marriage? Are, are these hackers maybe uh, disgruntled ex-customers of this website? Or maybe they are just simply disgruntled exes of people who use this website. So I went on a quest to try and figure out the answer. And thankfully, the team that conducted this hack, calling themselves the Impact Team, they have a brand, that's their name, the Impact Team, they released a manifesto explaining why they are going to take down Ashley Madison, why they want the CEO to quit, why they want this company to stop running dating websites for extramarital affairs. And the reason wasn't that they work for the Pope. Actually, the reason was that this company promises their customers secrecy and anonymity and privacy. You see, it's even in the brand. Anonymous members and tell no one. That's their promise. But these hackers discovered that if you actually want to stop using the service, so you are a paid client or even a free, you have even a free account on the service, but you want to stop using it one day. You feel bad about what you've done, you don't want to use it anymore. No problem, Ashley Madison will let you walk away, but she only asks for $20 to remove all of your information from the service. So this was maybe a good motivation for these hackers to show Ashley Madison, the people that run this company, that that's not a normative behavior for a business in the 21st century, at least not from the hacker's perspective. Of course, they, they did hurt a few people when they released the information, but what they did was even more profound, in my opinion. They effected a change in the dating industry and other industries online, where they put the CEOs and they put the executive team of this organization on notice, telling them, if you behave in a certain way, there are going to be people out there that will mess around with you. And they're not going to be law enforcement, and I don't work for the Pope. They're not nice, but they'll make a difference in the world. And I encourage you right now to ask your friends or your colleagues or your partners if they would sign up to this website, Ashley Medicine, after the hack happened. Probably not. Or they wouldn't tell you. All right. But massive leaks like this, like what happened to Ashley Medicine, happen in other industries as well. So part of my message for you today is that cybersecurity is not just an issue for engineers. It's happening in every industry. It's happening everywhere. For example, Sony Pictures Entertainment. I'm sure you heard about this Hollywood studio. And why was Sony Pictures Entertainment hacked? Anyone know? Any guesses? Probably heard about this in CNN and other websites, or other news outlets. The studio was hacked because they were going to release, a f to release a movie, a film, a film about North Korea. And uh, according to what um, the media says, and according to what the White House says, the North Koreans didn't like this movie. So they decided, based on their taste of narrative drama and Hollywood storytelling, that they will hack this studio. At least this is the story that the media tells you. The North Koreans hacked the Hollywood studio because they didn't want to see this movie out. I, for one, don't subscribe to this point of view. In fact, I think the only reason we even know about this movie is because of this massive hack, so it actually attracted more attention. And another aspect is that when Sony Pictures Entertainment was hacked and all of their files and all of their personal and professional emails were leaked out to the world, something actually kind of good happened, which is very surprising, especially if your name happens to be Charlize Theron and you're an Academy Award-nominated actress, because Ms. Theron was able to see in the emails that were leaked that as an award-winning actress starring in her next blockbuster movie, she wasn't receiving the same pay as her male counterpart. <laughs> True story. So she used this information to call for equal pay to Hollywood actresses everywhere. Great news for Hollywood actresses. Very happy for them. What about the rest of us? Well, hacking happens in every industry, and it affects all of us. In fact, what I learned as a hacker many years ago is that, that accessing information, releasing it to the public, manipulating security, 
influencing trust, these are currencies of power. This is not a solid state. You don't arrive in a place and that's it. You are trusted and trustworthy and secure. It is a constant journey and it is a currency. And for example, if you are Ashley Madison, you can be bankrupt one day and lose your trustworthiness and lose that currency. This is what hackers have known for a long time. And I learned this lesson from another Hollywood actress. Perhaps you know her. I don't know, she's a little bit well known. Angelina Jolie. You've seen her before? Okay. So this is from about 20 years ago, when she wasn't very well known as an actress. It was the year 1995. And Angelina portrayed a fierce young hacker called Acid Burn. I was 14 at the time. And when I saw this movie, it's a film called Hackers. It's very simple, Hackers. Has anyone seen this movie, by the way? Very good, very good. Ladies, it's a classic. You know, it's a classic. Air Canada thinks it's a classic. It's on their inside entertainment system under the classics category. Anyway, <laughs> unrelevant joke. Uh, in any case, when I saw this movie, and I, I was 14, I realized that this thing that I was actually doing, it, it's called being a hacker. Sitting up all night trying to access computers on the other side of the world, it's called being a hacker. Teaching yourself how to code HTML so that I could, and, and other stuff so that I could upload pirated videos of the prodigy to my own HTML website. In 1994, that's kind of hacking. And messing around with the CPU of my PC to make it run faster, overclocking, if anyone has ever done this, that's a form of hardware hacking. It's a thing. People do it. Angelina Jolie does it. <laughs> and she listens to the prodigy when she does it, and she's rollerblading in the movie. I was rollerblading at the time. Everything came together for me. And let me tell you something. It was very, very important that I met Angelina Jolie, that I met this vision of a hacker in that point in time. This movie gave me an, a very Hollywood romantic narrative that I still believe in. It gave me this idea that hackers are not the bad guys. They're the good girls. And it's a community of global people that are curious and creative, not criminals or spies. I never thought about hackers as the bad guys. I only thought about them as the heroes. And, you know, there's a good reason I saw heroes in the hackers, because this is what I looked like around that time. So this is a real picture from uh, you know, the yearbook picture from my elementary school on the steps of uh, the Tel Aviv school um, where I grew up. And it's not a trick question. I'm going to ask you, ladies in the audience, if you can find me there. It's not a trick question because I did come to school that day, and yes, I am in the photo. And then some people like to try and find me there. Any guesses? By the way, I should point out later on, I am asking you questions. Sometimes if you get the answer right, you get a prize. So it is literally an award-winning competition. Any guesses then? Yes. Second row. Which one? This one? OK, uh, spoiler alert, I did not have my hair in bangs 20 years ago, uh, 30 years ago. Yes, you are correct, madam. That's me. OK. So you know where I come from. <laughs> Geek pride all the way. That's me. And basically, <laughs> basically gadgets, my state of the art, you know, 93 Sony Walkman was like my best friend. I spent all the time, all of my spare time after school, either in the library or in the robotics lab, which was pretty awesome. We had an experimental robotics lab in our school or messing around with computers. You had a robotics lab. Do you see how important this stuff is? It is very important. I'm, I'm so privileged that I had this opportunity, I think. And I was really inspired to spend more and more of my time with hackers and with gadgets and with robots and online. And when I saw that movie, I realized this is my calling. This is what I am. This is what I would like to be. I would like to be a hacker. And I went on this quest to become a hacker. And I had to teach myself online and find chat rooms on IRC. Anyone here ever used IRC? Yeah? Very good. It's, a, it's an old school chat network. It's still around, by the way. Anonymous uses IRC all the time. I'm very happy to tell you 
my mission was successful. I managed to find my way into the hacker's world, first online and then later even offline, because in the year 2000, I was so lucky there was a hacker's conference right here, in, right in Tel Aviv, in my hometown. This is our state-of-the-art state of the art animated GIFs. And this is literally from the year 2000. What you're seeing now is an animated GIF file, which I dug up. It's archaeology, I guess. It's a 16-year-old animated GIF. Uh, but it was like the first time I saw these people in, in the real world. And I connected with hackers, and it was incredible. And a few years later, I was uh, very honored to be able to run one of these events myself back home in Tel Aviv in 2004. I'm also in that picture, a little bit easier to find. Back up there? Yeah. There's a thriving hacker community in Israel, and maybe it's the Israeli point of view, but most of the people that call themselves hackers are very proud to do so. At least back home, we don't think about hackers as criminals or bad guys. In fact, when it was my time to join the Israeli military, as every woman does at the age of 18, I was very lucky to be able to tell the military officers, and the first day, I kept saying, information security, cybersecurity, hacking. Finally, I found my way into the right department inside the military. And I gotta tell you, for me personally, it was an extremely equalizing experience. You might think about military as something very macho or chauvinistic, but in Israel, because everybody serves, it is a meritocracy. And it was my jumping board for a fantastic career that I'm happy to be, you know, moving on. I worked with a few companies you may have heard of, big and small companies. I've earned the CISSP security certification, which is a diploma for information security professionals. And academically, I work as a, both a teaching fellow and a researcher with Singularity University, which is in California, and Tel Aviv University's new interdisciplinary cyber research center back home in Tel Aviv. So that's kind of my puzzle. Now you have all the pieces, right? And I do most of these activities uh, under my own brand or my own hacker handle, which is K3R3N3. I spell the letter E with a three. It's very simple. You'll see it in, as we go along. By the time we're done, you'll be speaking hacker talk fluently. Don't worry. As you heard, in 2014, I was very lucky to be the first Israeli woman to be invited to speak on the TED stage. For those of you who don't know TED, it's an international conference where the talks are videoed, and then they are uploaded online and translated to many languages. And I was very, very lucky to have that opportunity because my message was that hackers are not the bad guys. Hackers can be a part of the solution. In fact, hackers might be the immune system for the internet and the information age, this digital era that we live in. Now that this talk has been viewed by millions, I wake up in the morning and I get messages and emails and tweets and faxes. Okay, no faxes. Uh, but uh, my mom still sends me faxes sometimes. I, I get messages from hackers from all over the world, from Latin America and Canada and Japan and Africa. And all these hackers have to say is that they see themselves as the good guys and the good girls. They want to be a part of the solution. They're not the enemy. So maybe it's, it's a good reminder for you all that I'm not the only romantic, idealistic hacker out there. There's at least a few other people that feel the same way. So if you want to learn from hackers, even if you don't want to, you know, maybe you don't want to learn from me, that's okay. There are so many other hackers out there that are eager to teach and share their knowledge. And I'll show you where you can find these hackers and how you can learn from them. The immune system. This idea went a little bit viral, if you don't mind the pun, and I got responses for so many people. But I know you're still thinking about hackers like this, right? Okay, it's my job to change your opinion from thinking about hackers like this to this. And I'm going to give you a good reason to change your mind about hackers right now. In fact, I'm going to give you a choice. <laughs> so by the end of the talk, you have to tell me if you want to take the red pill or the blue pill. What's your choice? And if you want to take the blue pill, go back to how life was. That's all, all cool. That's okay. But I recommend you take the red pill. Here's the first good reason why it's time to take the red pill. Cybersecurity is not just about our secrets. It's not about who we met online on Ashley Medicine or our Facebook passwords. 
Hackers don't care about that. These are very easily findable things, and they don't influence human lives. They don't really impact or matter in the big scheme. Cybersecurity in our future is going to be about our life, our modern way of life, and I mean that in the most serious way I can. It's going to be very intimate. If you happen to be a diabetic patient, you might have an embedded insulin pump like this. These devices are saving the lives or vastly improving the lives of diabetic patients. They automatically monitor the blood sugar and insulin levels and then administrate the right amount of insulin automatically. No need for 20 needles a day, etc. Just like any new modern technology, this device can be hacked remotely. But the company that makes this device didn't know about it and didn't even think about it. Not until a hacker called Barnaby Jack demonstrated this capacity using a radio antenna. He sent a remote signal to an insulin pump here, demonstrated by this mannequin, so no humans were hurt in his demonstration. But he was able to send a signal that sent all of the 300 units of insulin in the pump directly into the bloodstream. I don't have to tell you that could have lethal results. But the company that makes these devices didn't think about it. They didn't think that if their devices are accessible with a remote radio signal, which is a capacity they put in to help doctors monitor these devices. There's a reason it listens to radio signal. It's not a, you know, it's not a silly, you know, an unnecessary feature. There's a good reason where you put devices into the bodies of people, you make them radio accessible so you don't have to operate the person every time you need to talk to the device. It makes sense. But I didn't think about the cybersecurity aspect of it. The next stage for Barnaby Jack, who was a fantastic uh, inspiration to me, he was curious about pacemakers and whether the same sort of attack or different types of radio attacks could influence implantable cardiac defibrillators. Guess what? He found out they were. And not only did he find this out, another researcher, a woman, uh, her name is Mary Mo, and this is her Twitter account. She's a security researcher from uh, Scandinavia, and she actually has a pacemaker in her body. And she became curious about these devices as well and just how vulnerable they were. Because of her work, because of the work of Barnaby Jack, because of the work of dozens of other biohackers who are now specifically focusing their efforts on looking at what these new medical devices can do and how vulnerable they are, there is a change in the industry. And not just the industry, even government. The Federal Accountability Office in the United States, together with the FDA, recently issued a requirement that if you're a company making a medical device or a new medical technology, you're going to have to consider cybersecurity, you're going to have to perform testing, you're going to have to work with hackers or hire hackers to test the resilience of your technology. This makes sense. But it was only due to the efforts of these hackers that this change happened in this industry. And the medical device industry is not the only industry that's undergoing such changes. These are a couple of my hacker friends. They're a little bit uh, well-known these days. Their name is Chris and Charlie. Uh, maybe you've heard about them. Maybe you didn't hear about them, but you heard about their hobby. Chris and Charlie have a hobby, finding the most hackable cars out there. And uh, when they, they go through all kinds of models, all kinds of vehicles, and they find the security problems in them. Because a new vehicle, a 2016 car, especially in the United States, but also here in Europe, has a bunch of technologies in it, so many. Infotainment and GPS and apps and a bunch of stuff. So uh, maybe you heard about Chris and Charlie because recently they demonstrated what they can do with the top car on their list out of the top 20 cars. This is the top car on their list. It is the Jeep Cherokee 2015 model. And Chris and Charlie were able to demonstrate to a reporter from Wired magazine how they can literally take this car off the road remotely. So the journalist is sitting in the driving seat, but Chris and Charlie are sitting somewhere else in St. Louis, and they just did whatever they wanted. They turned on the music, they turned on the wind, uh, the windshield wipers, what do you call them? Yeah. And at some point, they killed the engine, and 
threw the car into a ditch, very gently, they didn't hurt anyone. But following this demonstration, Fiat Chrysler, that makes Jeep Cherokees, decided on a massive recall for one million vehicles in the United States to fix the problem that enabled the hackers to remotely do this. I don't know if you know a lot about car safety, but I can tell you, and I looked into it, that never in the history of car manufacturers was a recall of one million vehicles when a fatal accident wasn't involved. So this is the first massive recall of a vehicle before a catastrophe happens. Volkswagen? Sorry? Volkswagen. Volkswagen, yes, you are correct. This happened uh, in, around the same time, so you're right, Volkswagen, and their, uh, the changing of their um, pollution emissions from their cars, you're correct. Uh, in this case, a life and death issue was impacted because of the work of Chris and Charlie. And now the automotive industry and the car vehicle industry has to think about cybersecurity, and they have requirements from the uh, federal authorities in the United States. What about something nicer? Some people go to the office, uh, not in a Jeep, $80 million yacht. Of course, you're already guessing what I'm getting at. This vehicle can also be manipulated by a simple attack. In fact, a GPS radio or GPS signal spoofing attack. So sending a spoofed GPS a positioning signal, this is what allowed a team of researchers to take this yacht off course. And what I like about this story is that they used a laptop and an antenna, which is the same thing that Barnaby Jack used, and it's something that anybody could buy in a store. It's not something that only James Bond has. And before they tried it on an $80 million super yacht, they tried it on a drone. And this is the team of researchers from the uh, University of uh, Austin, Texas. And they were able to use the exact same attack to take down a drone in the desert outside Austin. And this is not new stuff. It happened a few years ago. So attacks and manipulations on radio signal and GPS are going to be a part of our future. And it's very scary when the companies that make these products, yachts, drones, cars, medical devices, don't necessarily take all of these things into consideration not before security researchers or hackers forced them to. Now, this is another one of my favorite hackers, and he is now into drone hacking. His name is Sami, Sami Kamkar. He's a very well-known hacker, and you can find him on YouTube because what he likes to do is hack other drones using his own drone. And I will explain. What Sami did was take a very uh, available commercial off-the-shelf drone, and then hack it so that it could hack other people's drones. And he put up a YouTube video explaining how he does, does everything and where you can buy the parts to do so yourselves. In fact, the parts are very easy to get. Uh, this is a, a Raspberry Pi microcomputer. Maybe some of you play around with the Raspberry Pi in your work or in your hobbies. Uh, this is a, a Wi-Fi signal antenna. Aircrack NG is a free Wi-Fi hacking software. And these are all of the components that he got and hacked together to create a drone that can hack other drones. Now, what I like about this story is that Sami is not malicious and he's not hurt a soul in his life. But other people are now learning how to do this. And they can buy these devices uh, from a, a store, or rather a company, run by this fantastic lady. Her name is Limo Fried. Have you heard about Limo Fried, perhaps, in the past? She not only has very cool pink hair, but she is an awesome hardware hacker and an engineer. And Limo Fried started her adventures selling Raspberry Pis online when she created her own project at school, uh, at college, I should say, which was supposed to create a bubble of uh, radio silence around her, a bubble that would what do you call it? Um, I... Yeah, well, it's not white noise. It's um... okay. I lost the word. It happens sometimes. Uh, she, this device was supposed to create a ra radio waves that would counter any other radio waves, so not GSM or other radio waves around her. In the military, uh, we have a term for it, but I lost the English word for it. Uh, like jamming, exactly. Electronic warfare. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. So she created this jamming tool, and it was supposed to be her graduation project. And her professor told her, you're nuts, nobody's going to buy it, and it's illegal. She said, OK, well, it's not illegal for me to put up the blueprints on my website and tell people how they can build it themselves. 
That's how she started her company, which is now worth millions and millions of dollars. And she was the first female engineer to be on the cover of Wired magazine, voted Entrepreneur of the Year in 2012, employs 50 people. Very awesome woman. She's a hardware hacker who was told that what she's doing would be criminal and nobody would buy it. She did it anyway. And I think that's pretty awesome. So, what would be the next frontier of cybersecurity if boats and medical devices are all hackable? Could it be in space? Don't worry, I'm not saying that the Mars Curiosity rover has been hacked. What I am saying is that it is vulnerable. And it is vulnerable because it speaks one of the most common languages in the galaxy at the moment. And this is for an award, an award-winning question. Anyone can tell me what is the most popular language in the galaxy at the moment? And please put your hand up so you can win the award if you get the right choice. There's no sanction if you don't get the right answer. It is not C++, thank you. No, it is not Python. Assembler, you getting close? Fortran, no, but this is fun. I have to tell you, when I spoke at another event, people were saying things like Klingon. You know, and, and you ladies get it. It is, a, it is a software environment that I'm speaking about. Yes. No, not COBOL. Thank you. One more guess? Yes? Ruby? No, not Ruby, but you're getting there. Uh, no, not HTML. I think I heard someone say... No. No, no, no. Yes. And it pains me that the only guy in the world, okay, not the only guy in the world, <laughs> but, <laughs> but actually, <laughs> thank you so much. You are correct, sir. It is Java, because it runs on billions of devices. And of course, Java includes JavaScript. I can hear you murmuring, you're right, it's JavaScript and the Java runtime environment, so it's a little bit bigger. But it is right now the most popular language on the galaxy, in the galaxy, because the Mars Curiosity rover, which is a laser shooting autonomous robot on Mars, talks Java. And all of our future devices are probably gonna talk Java, whether we like it or not. What's your name, sir? Okay, uh, come and see me later and you get an award, you get a book even. It's a book about women in tech. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> thank you. Good for you, and, and make sure to come and see me later so I can get your name right and sign it and everything. And don't worry, ladies, there's one more book if you get another question right. But you are correct, it is Java. Now, I don't have anything inherent against Java. The only problem with Java is that, much like other technologies, Java happens to be one of the most vulnerable computing environment of the past 25 years. So I'm, I'm not just saying that, in a very comprehensive review of all software vulnerabilities, that means all of the bugs that lead to a security impact in the past 25 years, or rather it's a little bit less than that because it was done in 2012, so looking at the 25 years before that, Java, owned now by Oracle, it's part of the Oracle uh, ecosystem, part of the, it used to be Sun Microsystems. This is, these are the nine or 10 computing environments that have had the most software vulnerabilities discovered in them. So anything we build for our future that is going to use these technologies, and I can guess that you're gonna use these technologies because you know, maybe you can quit drinking coffee, but you can't quit Java, right? <laughs> Okay, very geeky joke, but some of you got it, thank you. But you, you can't quit Java and, and Microsoft, thank you, and Adobe and all of these other technologies. You just can't, they're in the world, it's part of our ecosystem. Now guess what, all of this stuff is vulnerable, yes, but it's also going to be connected to all of this new stuff. And sometimes it's not even new stuff, it's just old stuff, like GPS and radio frequency and GSM that's been connected in a new way. Wouldn't it be naive to expect one company or one organization or even one government agency to figure out all of the potential problems that are going to happen when you connect this with this and then you put it on Mars? This is going to be the challenge for our future, I think. And I think this, this is a good reason to start thinking like an ecosystem, an environment. And in this ecosystem, we need 
anybody that can help us. We need that immune system. So uh, for another award, another prize, who can tell me what this picture is? It's not a neural network, thank you. No, you can't go again. <laughs> Any guesses? Cyber attacks, no? It's very simple, actually. Yes? The, the galaxy? Uh, you're getting there, actually, very close. OK, yes? No, it's not the brain. This is very simply, ladies and gentlemen, an image of the World Wide Web about 10 years ago. About 10 years ago. Now, of course, you know that the World Wide Web and the Internet is not the same thing, right? So that there are other things online, not just web browsable stuff, just to be sure we're on the same page here. But this was a very simple image. If, if you, you know, it's kind of simple from about 10 years ago. If I wanted to show you what today's internet connected world would look like, it would be a picture of our galaxy. You're right. You know what? You're right. You get the book. Yeah. So you come see me later as well, okay? What's your name? Maria, cool. This is our Milky Way galaxy, and that's a pretty accurate depiction of what you might think of our connected ecosystem right now. It's got planets and dark holes and all kinds of things and meteorites, all kinds of places. Wouldn't it be naive to expect one government agency or one organization to figure all of this stuff out? Ecosystem thinking. That's what I'm getting at here. Now, uh, hackers for the rescue, once again. A very cool hacker created a search engine for this galaxy, a search engine called Shodan. Shodan, like the black belt in karate, and you can use Shodan, you can use it for free, uh, to search for connected devices. So you will be able to find things like an internet-enabled toaster, or a power plant, or maybe some aspects of your organization, of your company that you didn't even know were accessible online. And Shodan is a great tool, and I recommend you take the time to learn how to use it, because it could be a fantastic resource for you when you go back to your company or your organization, and you want to see what's really out there, what's really vulnerable, what's really accessible. Shodan. Now, I, I know a team from Tel Aviv, or actually a little bit outside Tel Aviv, a security company. Their name is Encapsula. And they used this tool called Shodan, and they found a hacked CCTV camera in their backyard. Now, this, this camera wasn't hacked because people were interested to see what was happening in the, the, their backyard. Nothing interesting was happening there. The reason the camera was hacked was because, like many of these CCTV cameras, it is always on, it has great bandwidth, and it runs an embedded operating system that has very well-known security vulnerabilities. That means criminals can easily get into these cameras and turn them into assets in their cyber criminal botnet. And botnet is a network of infected or hacked devices and computers. So what this means, very simply, is that if somebody hacks your webcam in your office, your home, it might be to take pictures of you, but I don't think so. Nowadays, the criminals are interested in hacking webcams because they could be a resource to launch other attacks. So using a webcam like this to run a denial of service attack, for example, or a spam campaign. Now, imagine, you know, the, the problems of the past would be like you would have a fight with your neighbor because uh, his tree went over your fence or he didn't park in the dotted line. But the problems of the future are going to be that your neighbor's kids are hacking your drone and your toaster is sending him spam. And this is going to be the reality. And that, it sounds funny, but it's actually... Quite, quite dangerous, quite risky if you think about it, because that's the future we're heading to. This is not like a James Bond stuff, it's in your backyard, literally. So that's my first good reason to wake up to the hacker's world. This is the first good reason for that, you know, wake up and smell the coffee, wake up and smell the Java, that aha moment, if you will. But I have a few more good reasons for you, where you should think like hackers. Are you still with me? Yeah? You're still on the journey? You haven't taken the blue pill yet? Good. So the second reason, we are all as vulnerable as the weakest link in our organization, our company, our agency. And I'm sure you've heard this one before, so I want to give you some practical examples. 
Probably you heard about this company in the past two years and the massive breach they had, the massive hack that they had. Now, this is a company that takes cybersecurity seriously. They had an information systems manager. They had a $1 million a year annual cybersecurity budget. They still got massively hacked. And their brand got hurt as well. But it all happened because of a company that you've never heard of. This company, Fazio Mechanical Services from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is a family-owned company that does refrigerator maintenance. They also happen to be the refrigerator maintenance supplier for Target. And because of that, they had access to something called the Target Partner Portal, a web system, a web interface that gave the computers in this business access to the computers in this business. So that's why this organization that didn't consider itself a cybersecurity company and didn't have an annual budget, they didn't even have a paid antivirus installed. This was the reason they were the first soft target, if you will, for the target attack. And finally, this breach from the uh, partner portal into internal systems through a, a, using a vulnerability in the Active Directory configuration the bad guys, the criminals, were able to install malware on the point-of-sale devices. So these are the actual cash registers that read the credit card information as people swipe them. And this is a specific piece of malware that is designed to take the credit card details directly from the point-of-sale devices. So not from a central repository, but from all of the thousands of cash registers. And the result, of course, was pretty devastating for Target and for their customers. So who's standing in the front lines? Is it a government agency, or maybe it's your providers, or the weakest link? Maybe there's our, there are fierce cyber warriors standing at the edges, ready to protect you. Well, I have news for you, ladies. It's you. You're standing in the front lines. It's the code and technologies that you create that are at the front lines, that are getting attacked, that are getting exploited, that are getting manipulated. So there's nobody else out to save you. It really is up to you. And some really secure organizations could be taken down because of very small problems like that. In fact, I'm going to show you an example of one specific software vulnerability that caused a big problem. Anyone fly one of these to the office? <laughs> no? This is an F-35 fighter jet. Uh, it's the next best hope for any air, air warfare fights for Western countries. Uh, the US, Canada, Israel is also part of this multinational, multi-billion dollar project. And of course, the people that make this aircraft take cybersecurity very seriously. So they used one of these uh, RSA Secure ID tokens to uh, authenticate their partners and their providers. So when they let, let other people access their servers, etc., they use a very strong form of authentication. Now, these devices are made by RSA. RSA was acquired by EMC a few years ago, if you remember. And so one bright Tuesday morning in 2011, an employee at the Human Resources Department of EMC, a huge corporate, he gets an email, an email with an Excel file. An Excel file that you might get yourselves every day. And this Excel file, when he opened it, this is what the file looked like. So it looked like it was empty, where, in fact, this Excel file contained an exploit. An exploit is a weaponization of a security problem, of a security vulnerability. And this specific exploit was using a problem in a piece of Adobe Flash code. A Flash macro embedded within the Excel file, this was the first hole, the first bug, the first vulnerability. And as the guy opened the file and thought, well, it's empty, there's nothing in it, he closed it, moved on with his day. In the background, the attackers that sent this file were already making their way inside the network. At the same time, or about a week after, one week after, Adobe announced a software update to their Flash software. This software update that came out a week after this email already contained the solution, the fix to this vulnerability, but it was already too late for that organization. I'm going to show you the result of what happened in that hack. This is the result. Now, I'm pretty sure nobody drives one of these to the office, but do you want to venture a guess what it might be? Any guesses what this is? 
It's not the F-35 fighter jet. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the J-20 Chengdu model from Chinese aviation industries. And I will give you an option to compare them. I put the logo over there so you can see the difference. Now, this aircraft, the J-20 Chengdu model, uh, took its first uh, inaugural test flight somewhere around 2011. Now, you ladies and gentlemen are clever, you are engineers, you're going to say, wait a minute, Karen, wait a minute right there. If the company was hacked in March 2011, there's no way they could have created this aircraft and put it up in the air. It's not a Nike shoe that you just copy and, you know, put a counterfeit out. This is much bigger. This is a billion-dollar research project we're talking about here. And if you were to say that, you would be correct, because unfortunately, the F-35 fighter jet program was repeatedly and methodically hacked for years. And it's not my statement, it's the Wall Street Journal and other strategic reviews that have identified this. But don't take my word for it. Thankfully, since 2013, we can uh, take the NSA's word, because this is an actual NSA presentation from uh, around 2013, where the NSA, the United States National Security Agency, is discussing the potential damage created by not just that hack, but a previous hack into Lockheed Martin and their partners and providers that helped create this next fighter jet of the future. According to their estimates, about 50 terabytes of information, which is roughly the equivalent of about five times the Library of Congress, was stolen over time. So that's a very massive, that's a very big deal. It's a very big deal for all of us if we're counting on this F-35 fighter jet to be our advantage in any future fights. But they're not alone. It's not just Lockheed Martin or EMC. A lot of big-name companies that you may know, that you may work for or work with, have all been breached in the past few years. And if you take the word of Special Agent Keith Molarski from the United States FBI, there is a specific unit in the Chinese military that is responsible for a lot of these attacks. At least that's what they are saying. Uh, unit 61398. So, I know... Not a lot of you maybe had a military background, but uh, a very simple truth of militaries is that every unit has a number, and the longer the number is, the bigger the army is, because you have a lot of units. So I can tell you I come from a very small army compared to what they have. But this is happening because life is just like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> but more than that, a few years ago, there used to be a statement in the cybersecurity world that we build our systems, we build our networks like a candy bar. Crunchy on the outside, chewy on the inside. Have you ever heard that one before? You make it crunchy on the outside, so you make it very hard for outsiders to get in, but inside your networks, you trust everyone. Well, ladies, this is an outdated assumption. There is no more outside and inside, no crunch, crunchy outside. You know, this is not going to work. It's an ecosystem world where we are all connected. So it's also not about who's going to attack you and why, whether it's the North Koreans because they don't like your movie, or the impact team because they don't like your ethics. The real question for big organizations nowadays, I think, should be when is it going to happen and how are we going to react? What are we going to do when it happens? The FBI director likes to joke that there are only two types of companies out there. Companies that have already been hacked and those that don't already know it. This joke would have been funnier if it wasn't the truth. Unfortunately, it is the truth that about 100% of organizations have to deal with massive cybersecurity incidents, and about 100% of the times, they don't know about it before somebody else tells them that something happened. Because there's nobody out there to protect you. It's you on the front line. So you have to start thinking like hackers if you want to be safe on those front lines. Should we keep calm and carry on? I don't think so. It's time to share our information, to collaborate and innovate, because the bad guys are doing that, I can guarantee it. In fact, there are very creative and innovative bad guys out there. I'll give you one quick example, because I think we're about running out of time. Or is there anyone that can tell me what are we doing on time? Okay. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm good to go. Yes? Okay. I mean, if you need me to go off stage, just throw tomatoes at me and I'll get the, I'll get the, the hint. But 
This guy is a very successful cyber entrepreneur from Tallinn, Estonia. His name is Vladimir Chechen. And what uh, Vladimir Chechen and his team of uh, code warriors were able to achieve was a piece of malware, malicious code, that infected four million computers around the world. This piece of malware was called DNS Changer. Now, a very interesting thing happened with DNS Changer. Uh, this malware was not interested in your webcam, it was not interested in your credit card details, it was not even interested in stealing your files. In fact, when DNS Changer hit NASA, the American Space Agency, it wasn't interested in you know, where they kept the aliens or where ha what happened on the moon. It wasn't, he wasn't looking for any of that stuff. All this guy and his team wanted to do was something very simple. They wanted to get ads on people's computers. So this is something uh, that we call a combination of malware and advertising. Malvertising. <laughs> now, it doesn't sound very sexy, but it's a real problem. And I can assure you that your companies or you are seeing malicious ads all the time and don't even know it. And Vladimir Chechen made a lot of money because he charged the advertisers for all of those click views and banner ads that he was getting on people's machines. You know, almost like a victimless crime, only that it's, of course, not a victimless crime, and he is now facing charges in the United States. Now, this is very interesting. These malicious ads, or ads that can trick you into installing malware on your computers, they can show up in very respectable websites, like Yahoo, or the front page of the New York Times web, web page, because, as you know, these websites are serving you all kinds of content, and some of it is not safe or secure content, but you trust it because you think it's okay. If you see an ad on the New York Times, it must be okay. But in fact, Cisco says that you are 182 times more likely to encounter a piece of malvertising than to be impacted by malware on an adult porn website. Now, if, if you have any issue with the statistics, you can take it up with Cisco. I'm not sure how they checked this detail and how, how thorough and, and conclusive was their evidence, but I, I think it's interesting anyway that people think that if you visit bad websites, bad things will happen to you. But if you visit good websites, nothing wrong is going to happen. That's a wrong assumption. You can definitely encounter malicious content on very well-known brand websites. Ransomware? Maybe you've heard about ransomware recently. It's a very clever way for criminals to make money. Uh, anyone here dealt with ransomware in your organization? No? Nobody? Nobody brave enough to admit it, huh? Because I know ransomware is going around like the flu. This is a piece of malicious software that will encrypt your computer and then ask for a ransom to get the decryption key back. A few bitcoins, usually. And it's making a lot of money for criminals. These criminals only care about your money. They don't care about your files. They don't care about your webcams. They don't care about your privacy. They don't care about your credit card details. They take Bitcoin. All they care about is that you care about your files. So you will pay to get the decryption key. And you know what's the best, the best way to prevent ransomware from making your life really hard? It's backup. But nobody does it, because it's not sexy and it's not cool. True story. True story. This is why I think ransomware could actually be a killer app to get people back to backup. You know, I'm bringing sexy backup or something. I don't know. Okay, I'm still working on it anyway. Uh, but backup is, you know, backup could save your life if you have ransomware in your organization. You don't have to pay the bad guys, just revert to backup, but people don't. Uh, this is another unfortunate thing that criminals will do to get your attention they will put out an image like that, which is very heart-wrenching and very evocative. Je suis Charlie, you know, following the terrorist attacks in Paris. However, this GIF is actually je suis malware, because if you download this image, if you share it, if you click it, you will get malware onto your machine. So it's not just bad things will happen to you if you visit websites. It's very easy to get bad things on your machine in all kinds of ways all kinds of ways, and hackers don't care about, or criminals don't care about your privacy, or they don't care about your pictures, they care about using your machine as a resource to get money or to attack other machines. And there are lots of other resources that are making our life a lot harder. Have you heard about Heartbleed? 
Heartlaid was a massive vulnerability discovered in OpenSSL. Now, may, even if you've never heard about OpenSSL, I know that you used it, because everybody uses SSL all the time to encrypt our login screens and our e-banking and a lot of our communications. SSL is something that everybody uses. Unfortunately, when a vulnerability was discovered in OpenSSL by a team of engineers, uh, one in Europe and one in America independently, another thing was discovered. The American security agency had uh, access to an exploit of this bug for two years, but they didn't tell anyone, which means, I think, that they're also making American companies unsafe. But I don't blame them. They're doing their job. They're an espionage agency. They have a hammer. They, everything looks like nails. I understand it. However, this means that if you want to know who the real bad guys are out there, it's not General Alexander, the head of the NSA. The real bad guys that are going to make your life harder are software vulnerabilities. Heartbleed and Poodle and Bash, all of these vulnerabilities that now have sexy names. Maybe you've never heard about them, but they're going to make your life as engineers and as security or security-oriented engineers harder. So you're going to need all the help you can get finding these vulnerabilities, these bugs, these problems, because these are the real bad guys, if you ask me. Bugs. As long as humans write code, we will have bugs. The good thing is, uh, a new trend has started in Silicon Valley, something called bug bounty programs. Anyone ever heard about a bug bounty program? Very good. So these are the focus of my current research work, because these are extremely exciting ways for companies to directly collaborate with hackers that are finding bugs, finding vulnerabilities, and getting rewarded for it. And all of the big Silicon Valley companies are doing it. In fact, a study from a few years ago by Berkeley found that at least for Mozilla and Google, the researchers on the platform that were finding bugs in the Mozilla code and Google code, and they were outside of the company, the bugs that they were finding were, on average, of higher severity, which means that despite Google being able to attract the best security talent on board, they could still gain a lot of benefit from working with outsider hackers to look at their code. There's now an internet bug bounty for things like SSL and other technologies. And I want to give credit to this fantastic woman, Katie Misouris, who started the bug bounty program for Microsoft and now runs her own company, helping organizations figure out how to do bug bounty programs and work with hackers from all over the world. These bug bounty programs are creating a new ecosystem of hackers that are, for the first time in their lives, getting paid in a legitimate way, on the table, getting paid for finding a security problem, instead of getting branded as a criminal. So this has massive impact for the future of cybersecurity, I think, because it's creating the potential workforce. People like uh, Parisa Tabriz, for example. So Parisa works for Google. She's very awesome. Her title on her business card is Security Princess. That is her official title. You can find her on LinkedIn. And she runs a team of 30 engineers at Google securing Chrome, one of the most popular web browsers. So bug bounty programs and security research is helping create more roles for women in the hackers' world, legitimate roles for women. This is Marion Marshalek a reverse engineer, a woman that takes apart malware to find out which bugs it uses. She's from Vienna, and she's now you know, a rock star in the malware and reverse engineering world. So I'm very excited about the future women have in the hackers' world, because this new kind of ecosystem thinking is opening up many, many roads for us. Now, another organization that is opening roads, this is Tesla the innovative car company, electric car, car company, they brought their Tesla Model S, their flagship model, to the biggest convention of hackers on the world, DEF CON, in Las Vegas. 20,000 hackers in one big Las Vegas resort. And Tesla brought their car, and they said, come work with us. Come play with our product. We want to learn from you. And they're not the only ones that went there. I went to DEF CON to speak to hackers, but I wasn't the only one around. General Keith Alexander from the NSA went to DEF CON. Instead of his four-star general uniform, he wore jeans and a t-shirt, which is a hacker's uniform, and he tried to recruit the people in the room. He said, in this room right here is the talent our nation needs. Okay. 
hackers in the back row are like, okay, so stop arresting us, please. <laughs> Love to work for you. That was a few years ago. A few months ago, the Department of Defense, the US Pentagon, announced a program called Hack the Pentagon. Guess what? It's a bug bounty program for you know, one of the most secure organizations in the world that is actively seeking hackers' help. And I think that's pretty cool, too. Finally, there is one last good reason to wake up and take the red pill. There is a gap, a gap between the cyber world and you. You think it's a hacker's world, but it's up to you. You are in the front line. Cybersecurity impacts everyone. It even impacts Taylor Swift, <laughs> whose Apple iCloud account was hacked a few years ago. Uh, and a very funny thing happened. A new Twitter profile called Swift on Security uh, appeared, and this Twitter profile provides advice on cybersecurity and how to protect yourself. Swift on Security. And this account uses Taylor Swift as a way to get people interested in cybersecurity. And I think it makes sense. I think it's pretty awesome. Follow Swift on security. Finally, Cisco estimates that in the future we'll need one million more security professionals out there. Guess what? Some of them are going to be hackers. Some of them are going to be women. Some of them are going to be you. But if you're looking at a future career, or if you have a nephew, or a brother, or a son, or a granddaughter that's looking for what to do in their future, Cybersecurity is it. This is a job that's not going to be replaced by robots. Not anytime soon, I think. This is a woman uh, that actually helped create this book, this book uh, about women in tech. And she's a very successful hacker who started her way as a poker player. And she, she's a very lethal poker player. So when she started her first company, she went out to Las Vegas and she cleaned out poker tables to get the funding to run her first company. And uh, with that, she learned, she learned something very clever. She learned about a technology called OPM. Have you heard about OPM? OPM is other people's money. And Tara is an expert in OPM. And so when she decided to write a book to get more women into the industry, she ran a Kickstarter campaign, and she created this book. It was backed by Kickstarter, and today two of you are going to walk home, home with this book. I'm very proud to have contributed to it. Uh, if you want to get the book, it's on Amazon, so you can buy a digital version as well. Uh, okay, I'm going to run through this. Finally, cybersecurity impacts every business, all of your organizations. doesn't matter what you do, dating, Hollywood studio, cars, medical devices, aircraft, and you are on the front lines. This future is right here. The only question is, are you ready for it? Ready to take the red pill? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>